Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the Rogers Communications, Inc. fourth quarter and full year 2020 results conference call. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. Following the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star, then one on your telephone keypad. Should you need assistance during the conference call, you may signal an operator by pressing star and zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to Paul Carpino, Vice President of Investor Relations with Rogers Communications. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks, Ariel. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, I'm here with our President and Chief Executive Officer, Joe Natale, and our Chief Financial Officer, Tony Staffieri. Today's discussion will include estimates and other forward-looking information from which our actual results could differ. Please review the cautionary language in today's earnings report and in our 2019 annual report regarding the various factors, assumptions, and risks that could cause our actual results to differ. With that, let me turn it over to Joe to begin. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. It's been almost a full year that our country and our world have been living through a health crisis unlike anything we have seen in many generations. The impacts to society and to the economy as a whole have brought many new challenges, new perspectives, but also opportunities to all of us. It's encouraging to see vaccines starting to roll out across the country. And all the early days, we can see light at the end of the tunnel but we know the effects of the pandemic will be with us for some time. We recognize more fully than ever the role that our networks play in underpinning every aspect of our society and our economy. And I'm incredibly proud of the role that our teams continue to play in supporting Canadians and the Canadian businesses, large and small, through every phase of this pandemic. Today, I'll take you through some highlights of the quarter, followed by a discussion of our continued success in adapting to meet the needs of our customers while streamlining costs. Finally, I'll provide some thoughts on what we can expect heading into 2021 before turning it over to Tony to provide more detailed commentary. Despite the spike in the second wave across the country, and a new series of restrictions that have been rolled out and expanded in December in certain provinces, we saw continued improvement in many areas of our business. Our team executed strongly in Q4, delivering a number of sequential improvements, including margin expansion across the businesses, driven by continued operational efficiency gains, solid customer additions, excellent performance from our cable business, solid adjusted EBITDA improvements, and strong free cash flow. In wireless, we saw strong loading in postpaid with net additions of 114,000. Though the pandemic continues to impact roaming revenue with most travel still paused and no immigration growth as borders are essentially closed, our disciplined approach to digitization and cost management led to an adjusted EBITDA service margin up 370 basis points from the same time last year. Over the last quarter, we performed effectively across both traditional and digital sales channels. The preparation and collaboration across our teams ahead of our critical selling periods resulted in our most successful Black Friday ever. Over Boxing Week, however, the extended COVID-19 lockdowns in Ontario and Quebec in December did have some impact on service revenue, ARPU, and additional loading. Despite the competitive environment, our teams have managed to churn well, and our monthly postpaid churn improved seven basis points, the lowest it's been in over a decade. Consumer adoption of Rogers Infinite unlimited data plans has continued to grow increasing by approximately 300,000. We now have 2.5 million subscribers, and growth in our unlimited plans is up almost 80% this year. We continue to see positive ARPU, churn improvement, 
and lower cost of serve performance in this important base of customers. In terms of wireless network excellence, a year ago this month, Rogers was the first provider to launch a 5G network in Canada. Today, through the hard and disciplined effort from our team, we've delivered 5G to more than 160 communities across the country. From Fredericton to Fernie, from Laval to Lethbridge, Roger, Rogers operates Canada's largest 5G network. And proudly, for two quarters in a row, Q3 and Q4, UCLA awarded Rogers the most consistent national wireless network in Canada. In addition, Umlaut recently scored our 5G network in the greater Toronto area, Canada's most populated center and a hotbed for technology and innovation, with top marks for reliability, responsiveness, and download upload speed. In 2020, Umlaut also ranked Rogers as the best wireless network in Canada for the second year in a row. And in J.D. Power's 2020 Canada Wireless Network Quality Study, Rogers ranked number one in the West in Ontario. Our technology leadership continued in December as we launched the first standalone 5G core in Canada, powered by Ericsson, beginning with Montreal, Ottawa, Toronto, and Vancouver. The standalone core, considered the brain of the network, will propel us forward in bringing the full potential of 5G to Canadians. This positions the business and our customers well as we move into a 5G world, which as evident in more advanced 5G countries, will significantly increase data use and lead to new applications and use cases. Switching to cable, we saw healthy increases in both service revenue and adjusted EBITDA, despite the traditionally quieter period in Q4. As customers and their families continue to work and learn from home, they're able to benefit from what recent Ookla results have recognized. Ookla ranked Rogers as the most consistent national provider in Q4, fastest in our cable footprint in Q3, offering one gigabit speeds across our entire footprint. The number of Ignite TV subscribers is up 67% year over year as we continue to provide customers with more of the compelling content they want and make it easier for them to enjoy the entertainment needs. In 2020, we introduced Ignite SmartStream, which offers customers their favorite streaming service all in one place. We launched 14 new applications and subscription video on demand added Amazon Music with thousands of playlists and stations, and we'll continue to grow our content library and make Ignite TV and Ignite SmartStream the destination of choice for our customers. With an upcoming roadmap of new, of new apps that is very compelling from both a customer and a business opportunity point of view. And finally, in sports and media, our revenues continue to feel the impact of the limited live sports and truncated seasons as the second wave continues. But we managed our operational costs effectively and expanded margins. We're very excited that the NHL hockey season has now started. The creation of a unique Canadian division is important for both fans and our performance. And the first half of the NBA season is underway with Sportsnet broadcasting half the scheduled Raptors games. We generated solid free cash flow in the quarter, up 14% from a year ago, even as we continue to build out our digital capabilities and launch Canada's first and largest 5G network. Given our strong balance sheet with $5.7 billion in liquidity and exceptional wireless, cable, and sports and media assets, we feel well positioned in both the current environment and in the long term when the economy fully recovers. As we move through 2021, we will continue to build on the accelerated changes we have made in the past 10 months, the changes we've made to meet the evolving needs of our customers. We see that consumer habits are changing, some in the short term due to pandemic restrictions, others are far more permanent changes that assume a deeper role with digital and online channel support. Our teams have come together with incredible focus in the past year to rethink 
and reinvent how we serve our customers. And I'm proud of how they rose to the occasion and embraced this incredible opportunity. Let me provide a few examples of our leadership in this area. We accelerated our digital first plan and added self-serve options, offering a better experience for customers while streamlining costs. At the end of the year, overall digital adoption stood at 84%. We are unique in offering the convenience of seamlessly ordering online and picking up in store often the same day with our new Rogers Express pickup service. Customers can shop when and where they want while still having the opportunity to work with one of our in-store experts using all the necessary health precautions. Those staying at home entirely can take advantage of our industry-leading Pro on the Go service, now available in the Greater Toronto Area, Greater Vancouver, Ottawa, Calgary, Edmonton, and parts of Southwestern Ontario. Customers can get their new device quickly, safely, with, three con with free contactless delivery and one-on-one -on -one support on a video call. Our field technicians also no longer need to always travel to a home. Through our virtual assistance app and capability, our technical support agents are now able to resolve customer issues right away more often, reducing the need for even rolling a truck. And our Ignite self-installation program provides safe, easy, no-contact way for customers to install our Ignite Internet and Ignite TV services, with over 93% of customers choosing to easily install our products themselves. Since launching our customer virtual assistant at the end of 2018, we've now managed more than 7.2 million conversations, up 39% since last quarter and nearly 133% since last year. With continued developments in AI, we expect more calls will be redirected, reducing costs and leaving our agents to spend time with customers who have the most important and more complex needs. As we've enhanced our digital capabilities and customers shift to online options and self-install, we know the calls we do get are even more important. We're proud that our teams are now all based in Canada. We've invested to make sure they have the tools, they have the training that they need to continue to deliver the capabilities to our customers. Their level of engagement is best in class. Their expertise in our products and services and their ability to relate to the needs of our customers as part of their community. All of this provides us with a competitive advantage, directly impacting lifetime value, ARPU, churn, and supporting the future of our business. This past year has brought, some importance, has brought home the importance of connectivity like never before. As we invest in improving customer experience, we continue to invest in expanding and upgrading our networks. As we work to rebuild our economy, strong digital infrastructure and investments in 5G are incredibly critical. We need them to fuel productivity, fuel innovation across the country, both in the coming months and in the longer term as Canada resets its competitive landscape. What will this all mean for our company as we move forward into 2021? While we will continue to experience uncertainty due to COVID-19, our long-term vision has not wavered. We are focused on investing in core assets to generate long-term value for our shareholders. And in fact, we will be driving further network investment this year. Our priorities are centered on expanding our world-class networks, delivering a best-in-class customer experience, and building a high-performing inclusive culture, all underpinned by our long-standing commitment to be a strong, socially and environmentally responsible leader in our communities. While Q1 is traditionally the slowest quarter for subscriber loading, intensified this year by lockdowns in some provinces, we have some critical advantages heading into 2021. We have far better capabilities and deeper understanding of how each of our markets are likely to react in a pandemic than we did a year ago. And importantly, we've honed our ability to be agile and pivot our services to where our customers need us to be. This will continue to serve us well as we recover from the pandemic 
and frankly, far beyond. In wireless, we're heading into a 5G world with the most wireless subscribers in Canada, the largest 5G network, the largest iPhone base, and the largest number of customers on unlimited plans. This, this puts us in a very strong position. Since launching our unlimited plans 18 months ago, we've completed the majority of our overage revenue melts versus our peers. We are well positioned for future growth as we complete the overage transition, which we anticipate will take place by the end of the second quarter of this year. Additionally, with the largest roaming operation, we expect to be the major beneficiary when travel returns, further supporting wireless service revenues and ARPU growth in the future. In cable, we're anticipating both revenue and adjusted EBITDA growth in the coming year. This continues to be a stable business. We will further benefit from the comprehensive Comcast product roadmap, including the benefits of self-install capabilities I just mentioned. Our internet business already delivers one gigabit speeds across the entirety of our footprint. So we have a long runway ahead of us since our hybrid fiber coax network is not expected to require massive investment to generate the speeds customers need now or in the future. Finally, in media, we have an unparalleled mix of Canadian sports assets. We anticipate continuing to manage the business efficiently in the near, in the near term, and we are confident consumer and advertising demand will be strong when schedules and live audience, audiences return to normal. All of these assets are supported by our healthy balance sheet. The company remains financially strong and is well positioned to increase investment and capitalize on the future recovery and long-term growth opportunities. In short, while 2021 will still be a year marked by some uncertainties because of the pandemic, we believe the combination of our long-term vision, our second to none set of assets, the improvements and efficiencies we've applied in 2020, and our strong, capable, resilient teams will enable us to meet the needs of our customers and our country now and into the future. And with that, let me turn the call over to Tony. Tony, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Joe, and good morning, everyone. Our fourth quarter results reflected healthy, sequential gains in margins across all our businesses, excellent free cash flow growth, and strong revenue growth in cable. The expanded late quarter lockdowns during the key Boxing Day selling period did affect wireless revenue late in Q4, but margins were very strong. Let me break down results in each of the businesses a bit more and then provide some commentary on our outlook for the first quarter. In wireless, margins were strong despite the pressures on service revenue and adjusted EBITDA associated with the extended and expanded lockdown and the ongoing impact of limited roaming revenue. <clears throat> Service revenue declined 8% year-on-year, driven by roving revenue declines of $75 million, or 67% from one year ago. Additionally, as we continue the transition to Rogers' infinite unlimited data plans, overage revenue was down $40 million, or 54% year-on-year. Importantly, overage revenue is now only about 1.5% of service revenue, and we continue to anticipate overage melt to continue to impact our year-on-year -year growth rates until the end of the second quarter. Notably, this timeline is in line with our original expectation on the launch of unlimited plans back in 2019, where we estimated the impact on our financial growth rates to take six to eight quarters to overcome. The extended and expanded shutdown in late December further impacted service revenue versus Q3, as well as on a year-over-year -year basis. In addition to the reductions in roaming and usage revenue, there was an additional $30 million decline from the fourth quarter last year, which relates to the impact of one-time fees for activations and related items. We attribute the decline in these fees to the COVID environment in the fourth quarter, and in particular in the final weeks. We expect these fees to resume as consumer activity increases in the future. 
On a year-over-year -year basis, the blended ARPU, ARPU decline of just under 10% was most notably impacted due to reductions in the roaming and overage revenues, as well as the decline in one-time fees, as I mentioned. To provide some additional transparency on this, our normal annual inbound and outbound roaming revenue prior to the pandemic was approximately $500 million, or about $4 of blended ARPU. So we should see a decent improvement in blended ARPU as roaming and the economy recovers. Sequentially, blended ARPU was down about $1, and this again is a result of the reduced free fees from lower consumer activity mentioned above. While the late quarter shutdown also affected subscriber activity, including during the Boxing Week period, Rogers still delivered solid loading and had a strong Black Friday. Postpaid net additions were a healthy 114,000, and our unlimited customer base grew sequentially again by another 300,000. This base now stands at an impressive 2.5 million subscribers and continues to position us well as 5G networks and capabilities develop. Postpaid churn improved to 1.19% compared to 1.26% last year. The improvement reflects strong execution by our teams in the COVID environment during a very competitive quarter. Although we can't control the revenue impacts driven by the pandemic, we continue to control our costs and overall efficiency. Despite revenue being down 8%, wireless adjusted EBITDA only declined 3%. This resulted in continued improvement in adjusted EBITDA service margin to 63.2%, reflecting an improvement of 370 basis points from last year. Clearly, our efficiency initiatives are gaining some traction, which should further underpin strong revenue flow through and profitability growth rates when revenue recovers. Overall, we're pleased with how our teams continue to navigate our wireless business in this unprecedented environment. While we currently remain in lockdown in both Ontario and Quebec, we built out our competencies since the pandemic impact started accelerating 10 months ago. We are now very well prepared to support customers with advanced digital capabilities, have all our co call agents working from home, online ordering with same day pickup, and are providing home delivery options that are being well received by our customers. Moving to cable, revenue increased 3%, driven by an increase in ARPA as well as more customers transitioning to our Ignite internet and TV offerings, as well as modest service pricing adjustments. Homes past and customer relationships each grew year over year and sequentially. While internet and Ignite TV net additions were down year over year, sequentially internet net additions increased to 20,000 and Ignite TV net additions almost doubled to 71,000. Adjusted EBITDA grew nicely, up 5% year over year as a result of the increased revenue as well as continued improvement in cost efficiencies. This gave rise to margin of 51% this quarter, up 60 basis points from last year. We continue to see improvements in capital spending efficiency as well, with self-install now representing over 93% of all installations and ongoing improvements in hardware costs. CapEx intensity for cable remained at 22% for the second straight quarter, and as a result, cash margins for cable were at 29%. For the full year, cable capital intensity was 24%, down from 29% in 2019 and 36% in 2018. We believe that these improvements are sustainable, and we continue to expect to operate in the low 20% capital intensity range for the foreseeable future. In our media business, revenue decreased by 23% year over year as a result of reduced live sports programming, primarily from delays to the start of the NHL and NBA seasons and softness in the advertising market due to COVID-19. Media adjusted EBITDA increased by $60 million from last year, primarily due to the delayed start of major sports leagues and lower general, general operating costs as a result of reduced operating activity. On a consolidated basis, total service revenue was down 7% and adjusted EBITDA was up 4%. If you exclude the impacts of roaming and overage, 
we would have been down 3% in revenue and up 11% in adjusted EBITDA. COVID-19 impacts in Q4 were notable, with estimated impacts of $285 million in revenue and $60 million in adjusted EBITDA. On a full year basis, you can see how meaningful the effects of COVID were to our business. We estimate revenue for the year was down 1.4 billion in 2020 and adjusted EBITDA was down 500 million. These are meaningful disruptions to our business and our customers, but our teams have managed these impacts well. In dealing with these significant declines, we established a $90 million provision for bad debt in the second quarter last year. While it continues to be difficult to predict how consumers and businesses will be affected by the extended lockdown, I'm pleased that the performance to date within our bad debt allowance is currently running better than anticipated, and our provision continues to offer appropriate and sufficient coverage as the economy continues to work its way through the COVID environment. Capital expenditures in Q4 were $656 million, up 30% sequentially as we played catch up on some projects that were deferred due to the pandemic. With this increase, capital intensity was also up sequentially to 17.8%. We expect to increase our CapEx in 2021 from the $2.3 billion spent in 2020 as we accelerate investments in our 5G and broadband networks, and I'll provide a bit of color on that shortly. Cash income taxes increased this quarter as a result of the timing of installment payments. As our base quickly moves to installment plans for their handsets, this results in a, an expected earlier taxable event which is one time in nature. As a result, our cash tax rate as a percentage of adjusted EBITDA was 11% in the quarter, up sequentially from 5% in Q3. We will see our cash taxes temporarily increase in 2021 as we continue to transition to a device financing business model, and I will comment on our outlook momentarily. Free cash flow for Q4 was $568 million, up 14% from a year ago, but down 35% sequentially as a result of the higher capex and cash taxes. In terms of financial strength, we ended the year with $5.7 billion of available liquidity. We also returned $253 million in dividends this quarter and $1 billion for 2020. Our weighted average cost of borrowing was 4.09% as at December 31st, 2020, and our weighted average term to maturity was 12.8 years. In our focus to maintain a strong balance sheet, we prudently managed our borrowings to balance term and cost of borrowing to what we believe is an optimal mix. Turning to 2021, we continue to hold off on providing annual guidance at this time. The COVID conditions that led to our withdrawal of our guidance back in April of 2020 continue today and there is little, if any, further clarity of the impact of the pandemic on our business and its recovery. That said, we will continue our approach of providing the quarterly transparency we have provided since the pandemic commenced in Q1 last year until such time that a useful and credible guidance range can be estimated. While we have reasonably good insights as to how our business may perform on a quarterly business, we will need better visibility on the progress of lockdowns and the resumption of growth, dri growth drivers in order to have a reliable full-year full outlook. These drivers include roaming, economic recovery, and resumption of immigration to Canada, to name a few. As you saw in Q4, the need by provincial governments to quickly implement additional safety measures, even late in the quarter, can impact results. However, I think it's important to re reiterate that while we can't control near-term near events, such as additional lockdowns or timing of vaccinations, our teams have adjusted significant, significantly in terms of how to operate in this volatile environment. Unlike Q1 of 2020, Q1 this year will reflect a full COVID quarter in which there are broader and extended lockdowns. In our wireless business, as you have seen in the past years, the first quarter has become a very quiet loading period for the industry, even when stores are operating under normal conditions. 
With the additional lockdowns in effect in both Ontario and Quebec continuing into February, we anticipate that Q1 will likely be quieter than normal in wireless loading and service revenue opportunities. Over the past two years, you have seen us approach the Q1 environment with less promotional activity given the moderate demand environment, and that is always our approach. Regardless of the demand environment, we are in a strong position to provide first-rate service to our customers through our significantly expanded digital capabilities and services such as Express Pickup and Pro on the Go. We believe ARPU will improve its year-on-year -year profile so that the percentage decline will be less than what we saw in Q4, although we may likely see a, site, a slight sequential decline due to the seasonality of ARPU variables. With overage revenues, we are approaching the end of the impacts of the overage melt associated with our shift to unlimited plans. We believe we are well ahead of our peers in completing this transition, and we anticipate Q1 overage to be down $25 million on a year-over-year -year basis. We expect to be through the majority of that, this transition by the end of Q2, and as we have highlighted in the past, underpinning these plans are better Ar ARPU opportunities, lower churn, and improved customer satisfaction by driving the simplicity dividend for them. Lower roaming revenue will continue to impact revenue in ARPU, and we expect it will be down approximately $75 million year on year in the first quarter. In our cable business, we expect additional year over year growth in revenue, adjusted EBITDA and adjusted EBITDA margins as we benefit from efficiency gains and modest price increases. While this business is not completely immune to the economic pressures related to the COVID lockdowns, it is more stable as customers continue to rely on their home connectivity and are moving to higher speeds to support their business and family needs. Additionally, CapEx intensity is expected to be approximately 22%, down from 26% in Q1 last year as benefits from self-install and the Ignite TV platform continue. In our sports and media business, after a quiet Q4, Sports programming is ramping up for the NHL and NBA in Q1, and fans and advertisers alike will welcome their return. As a result of the increased live sports broadcasts, programming fees will increase in Q1, but advertising revenue should also start to make a modest recovery from Q4 levels. Our best estimate at this point is that revenue and adjusted EBITDA for our media business will be in the same absolute dollar range as Q1 last year. Of all three leagues, MLB is expected to have a full 162-game schedule starting in April, and at this point, we do not know if the Blue Jays will be playing at the Rogers Center or if any games will benefit from in-stadium attendance and revenues. This could result in additional losses for the Jays for the full year, but we will continue to monitor how the season unfolds and provide updates as appropriate. In terms of CapEx, we are planning to increase our investment in 2021 from the 2020 levels as we continue to enhance our cable and 5G networks. Although we're not providing full year guidance at this time, we anticipate CapEx in the first quarter will be at about the same spending level as Q1 last year, and then we'll ramp up from that level in the following quarters. By the time we report our Q1 results in April, we could have additional clarity on the impacts of lockdowns on our CapEx activities, and we may be in a position to provide additional guidance on our 2021 CapEx expectations at that time. And on cash taxes, as seen in Q4, we will continue to reflect our transition to a device financing business model that results in earlier recognition of equipment revenue for income tax purposes. As a result, we expect a final $325 million cash tax installment in the first quarter. As mentioned earlier, these advanced tax payments are one time in nature, and by the end of this year, we expect our ongoing cash tax rate to be back to a range of 8 to 10% of adjusted EBITDA. Finally, free cash flow in Q1 will reflect the impacts of higher taxes, and we expect this will be the only major reason it will be down on a year-over-year -year basis. In summary, I hope this extensive quarterly transparency gives you some good insight on the business 
until the time we return to annual guidance. As we head into 2021, we're very proud of how the Rogers team is navigating the current environment. While there continues to be uncertainty in the near term as to how the ongoing impacts of COVID will influence the Canadian economy, we have implemented significant changes throughout the company over the past 10 months and we believe we are positioned very well to manage through the short-term volatility and as the economy recovers. Let me now turn the call back to the operator to commence with our Q&A. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star then 1 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then two. Our first question comes from Vince Valentini of TD Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Tony, let me push you a bit on the, the ARPU in Q4 and, and the commentary you've given. So first off, can you give us a bit more color on what this $30 million of lower consumer activity um, impact is? Cause you keep mentioning activation fees, but I mean, if I assume forty dollars as an activation fee on average, I mean, sometimes you waive those fees, but at forty dollars, that would be seven hundred and fifty thousand gross ads that would be needed to to be down year over year to 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 add up to thirty million dollars. So there's got to be something other than just activation fees in there. And one thing I don't hear you talk about in terms of the ARPU trends and Q4 being a bit worse than Q3 is, you know, I think we all acknowledge there was some pretty aggressive promotional behavior going on back in the, the August, September period as the lockdowns end, ended and everybody started uh, jamming out promotions to try to catch up on, on sub ads. Is there not a bit of an impact there from that as well, that as you have a full quarter of some of those subs that were loaded at, at lower price points, uh, that had a bit of a drag on on Q4 ARPU relative to Q3, and if that's the case, can you, can you or, or, or Joe give us some some thoughts on the more recent activity we've seen, which which seems to be a bit more encouraging in terms of some of those aggressive promotions being pulled from the market by all the incumbents and and even some price increases announced to selectively by some of the wireless carriers. So a few few different dynamics on ARPU, if you don't mind. Thanks. Great. Thanks for uh, the question, Vince. Uh, a couple of things. In terms of the $30 million, it comprises a couple of things. I mentioned the activation fees. There are price plan change fees, uh, reconnection fees. Uh, but the other item uh, that is rather significant are what we call the one-time promotional credits, uh, such as gift cards. Um, and so it's that volume that we sort of saw down year on year. Um, second part of your question um, relates to whether or not we saw pressure on underlying ARPU as a result of the promotional activity? Uh, and the short answer is yes, but at the margin. Um, those types of promotional activities played out in the flanker brands. And so while we saw good ARPU growth uh, with moves from our customers and new customers to unlimited, uh, what we saw was a bit of an erosion on ARPU uh, as a result of those promotions. Net-net, it had a very slight, uh, I would say, minor impact to our underlying ARPU and service revenue trends in the quarter. Um, those were to continue. It continue to have um, a growing impact. Uh, but what we saw in the marketplace is a pullback of those promotions um, after year end. Uh, and so we continue to be confident with the underlying ARPU growth profile uh, for this year. Uh, but, of course, it will depend on um, market competitive intensity and how it plays out um, later in this quarter or into next quarter. If I can add a couple of comments, Vince. Um, you know, we saw some, uh, to your point, really uh, significant pricing aggression through Q4. Um, and Tony's right in terms of how he impacted uh, um but that level of aggression, you know, always uh, creates froth in the marketplace. Uh, the team did well in terms of adding customers, but also the churn. You saw the churn down seven basis points. Um, but, you know, as part of that, there is uh, a retention activity that's required. When customers see some of those prices in the window, 
then you know we get phone calls asking, hey, you know, can I get that price? So there is there is a price plan impact that you know happens across the industry whenever we see that kind of that kind of aggression and promotion going on. I would say to you that that the aggressive wireless price bundling with cable that we saw that happened and started in Western Canada, in our minds, is not something. It's a bit of a zero sum game. It's not something that uh, you know we've seen it before. Uh, in different parts of the business uh, here in Ontario and in other countries, it, it, it's not sustainable in the sense that it doesn't really do anything to change uh, share dynamics in a structural way whatsoever. Um, and the experience in the past is that uh, all it does is it creates some of the ARPU pressure and economic impacts uh, for everybody. So we're really pleased to see um, you know, uh, the return to discipline in Q1 around the pricing environment. Um, and it's just normal that in Q4 uh, that there is aggression in pricing. It's just been the case in Q4 uh, forever. I think part of what played as well is we'll see how big the market was in Q4. Uh, our sense the market was somewhere between flat and down a few points. And so you get this sort of increased intensity when there's no immigration, there's no growth in the wireless market. And again, as that returns or that gets to a place where, you know, both penetration growth and immigration growth create more new net customers to the market, um, our experience has been that some of the pricing aggression remediates or dampens uh, as a result of that. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Uh, next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Jeff Fan of Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Hope you guys are well. Um, just one question regarding the uh, the wireless competitive uh, outlook, and then another question on 5G. On on just the competitive outlook, um, what we saw last year in 2020, as uh, Vince alluded to, when the market opened up, there was a, a rush to promotional activities. Um, as you kind of look up to this year, I mean, we are hopefully coming out of a lockdown sometime in Q1, maybe in Q2. How do you think about the competitive dynamics as you kind of go into that middle of the year? Um, are we, can we see a repeat of what we saw last year is when the pool is still small and operators are chasing? Or do you think the market is going to be a little bit more um, perhaps rational waiting for some of the volumes to come back, as you alluded to, Joe. And then on the 5G question, um, you know, I, with, well, Rogers obviously is leading um, with respect to being first and the biggest on 5G. I'm just wondering when you think customers will start to really recognize 5G as a, as a major differentiator versus 4G and what are some of the indicators that you're looking at as positive signals for that to um, to start to happen? Thank you. I think to your question, um, you know, will this summer be like last summer? Um, and I would say, you know, last summer was our first real understanding of what it felt like to come out of a pandemic. I mean, Jeff, there's no playbook for it, right? We just said, okay, game on. Um, what people are out and about, uh, restrictions have been uh, softened, lifted in many parts of the country. We saw data uh, growth spike tremendously almost overnight. We saw 30 to 50 percent data growth. So there's sort of a muscle reaction that says, okay, game on, let's go. And therefore, it creates a sense of, you know, froth, growth, and, and let's go make up for whatever didn't happen the previous few months. I think we'd all look back at that period, and now we have a much more sanguine understanding of the real economic outcome, a lifetime value and economic outcome of that froth and that intense period. So I think our second time through it uh, as an industry, I think it'll be a mix. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some level of aggression, but I think there'll be a much more kind of rational, sanguine look at it and say, you know, where where are the value economics in this? Where are the value drivers in this? So. Uh, that's my view. It's you know, and my hope is that there's not a third crack at it, uh, and that everything points to the fact that will will come out. I think the biggest 
thing that you should take comfort in Rogers is that the capabilities we have now are vastly different than the capabilities we had a year ago. I mean, our ability to transact online was, I would say, you know, um, not terrific a year ago. Uh, right now, I think it's very good, very strong. And the ability, I touched on in my comments, the ability to order online, pick up in store, have it delivered to your doorstep, these are all things that the team worked hard to make happen through last year. And, you know, part of the reason you see some of the, the margin improvement is that we've been able to kind of impact some channel mix that has a far more uh, attractive COA as a result. And therefore, we've got an ability to not just play the game differently, but to do so with better economics given the channel and COA characteristics that, that are leaning in our favor because of those capabilities the team works so hard on. So that, that's the view on that. Um, you know, um, in terms of 5G, 5G is, is uh, like, like 4G, and, and other investments, we're in the investment cycle of 5G. And, you know, the capabilities are here and now in terms of the Ericsson investment that we made and the ability to light it up. Uh, the standalone core needs to be done at some point, so we did it. We'll keep expanding it, uh, et cetera. And as I've said to you, I think in the past, you know, 5G will come in tranches. Uh, unlike 4G and 3G, which were these sort of big, turn on the lights and now we have a brand new capability. 5G will come in tranches. The first tranche is, is already happening uh, as 5G iPhones and 5G Samsung phones hit the market. We'll see um, you know, more of those in our base. And given some of the capabilities of 5G architecture, we have a better ability to deliver um, a gig of data at a better unit cost. And, you know, when Canada sits at three gigs a month on average and the U.S. is closer to 10 and Korea is closer to 30 gigs a month, uh, we're on that path. And the ability to do so in a way that's far more cost effective is important to the economics of this industry. So that's sort of the first prize. The first prize is really kind of uh, economics of bandwidth. Uh, the second prize around 5G um, I think will be a series of applications that you know come to light along the way. Uh, one of them will certainly be fixed wireless access. I mean, you've seen you know the beginnings of what I would call 4G fixed wireless access in the industry. Uh, you know, 5G will make those economics and that capability and population density enablement even better around that front. You know, how far away is that? Uh, that's in the next, call it one to two years away. And then the one that gets all the media attention uh, is around what are the IoT low latency type applications. Uh, I would tell you that they're being worked on right now, and there is evidence of some of those uh, already in the market, uh, like the automation we've done in the city of Kelowna, for example, that's been publicized, or some of the work that we're doing with mining companies around using 5G capabilities to you know, create more automated uh, capabilities on the mine site, et cetera. These are B2B applications, and they will happen as each of the B2B verticals matures. And some verticals will mature more quickly than others. Um, so, I mean, if you're looking for a full P&L on 5G, uh, I think you get, you know, the, the, a real material P&L is, is in that three to five year time zone away. Um, but we've got to invest now because these things take time and effort. You know, the 70% of the work in network investment is civil engineering work. 70% is people digging trenches, trenches, acquiring sites, building towers, swinging fiber. And you can't turn those things on at a dime. You've got to do them, you know, years ahead of time. And, and that's what you're seeing coming from us as an organization. And along the way, what you're hearing us say as well is, you know, we've got a great network. We've got the best network, and we continue to get accolades for it all around. Um, it was on this call a few years ago that people were asking, you know, how's the Rogers network doing? You know, a lot of questions around capability and performance. I would tell you that we have best-in-class networks, and we lead the industry, and it's more of a reinforcement that, that that's a crown that we're never letting go of. Uh, and 5G is also a sense of pride for this organization in being first and driving the largest opportunity. And, 
having a sense of pride and innovation in the hearts and minds of engineers is important to the culture of a, tech, of a telecom company. So I think that's those are the, the, the you know, honest to goodness mindset reasons around it. We're blessed in Canada to have very good 4G networks, LTE networks. You know, then you look at the countries that have, you know, lackluster 4G networks, 5G is taking on a lot more prominence. So the 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 contrast between 4 and 5G will come will come over time, as I've said. The one thing we had to do to get ready for 5G is we had to launch unlimited. We had to. Like we we couldn't have a a, a overage based regime around the customers that want to use the most data that was, you know, in a paradigm that came out of 3 and 4G and expect to ever take advantage of 5G. You know, look at some of the early gaming apps. You can burn up 10 gigabytes in a few minutes, right? So um, my point is this is all the orchestration towards the 5G future. And, you know, uh, I would say that later on this year, we'll probably once again have a bit of a 5G, where's it all going for Rogers discussion. Uh, once we come out of the quiet period around the spectrum auction, I think that'd be a great thing to do. And Paul will set it up for the investment community. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Jeff. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Simon Flannery of Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Right. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Tony, uh, I wanted to follow up on the operating leverage. It's it's great to see the margin improvement uh, despite the top line pressures here. And you've talked a lot about digital transformation and things like that. How should we think about as the economy reopens, as travel recovers, how much of this um, improvement is permanent and how much will be kind of given back in terms of increased um, roaming uh, costs and other uh, uh, things that you're not spending on uh, currently. And, and on that roaming piece specifically, uh, how much of it is, is attached to business travel returning, which you know, might take a little bit longer than tourism? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, Simon. I think um, with respect to leverage on costs, if I understood the question, um, what we should see as roaming returns uh, and some of the other items is a very high flow-through rate uh, to our margins. And so we currently have, uh, even in a very low growth environment, plans to continue to expand margins. Uh, and so what we should see as roaming returns net of, uh, net of um, roaming costs uh, is a good healthy flow-through rate um, in excess of 50% uh, and probably as high as 60% uh, to put a rough estimate on it. Right. And what about other, are there other costs that you're, you were able to save on this year that, you know, may come back in terms of, you know, as activity advertising, T&E, things like that, that we should be aware of? There are variable costs, of course, that are going to, um, you know, as the, um, market expands or the size of the market and our volumes increase. There are um, uh, variable related costs, as Joe referred to, uh, COA um, or um, COR type of costs. Uh, those are variable in nature, but I think it's important to highlight that the quantum of them have come down, uh, particularly as we move to more efficient channels like digital. Uh, and so, um, again, within the broader um, within the broader uh, margin expansion comment that I made, um, we've captured those uh, within that. Um, if I had to sort of go through each of the you know, specific items, uh, I've talked about channel mix. Um, I think it's important to highlight the uh, margin improvement we've seen uh, from moving to installment plans. Um, and as volumes go up, we don't think that's going to erode. Obviously, that's going to depend on uh, the economy. Um, and then there are improvements that we're seeing throughout uh, our businesses in the back office. Um, again, as we move to more and more AI and automation uh, in those areas. Uh, on our cable business, um, some of the areas that we're seeing cost improvements, Joe mentioned self-installation. Um, number of service truck rolls uh, has come way down, and that really uh, gets at the operating efficiency um, of uh, uh, of having uh, completed some of the uh, service calls uh, the first time. Uh, we've had good progress on our content costs, uh, and you see that in our P&L in terms of managing what was previously a continually escalating cost for us 
um, and we've been uh, much more creative and uh, um, better executing in terms of those costs. Of course, in cable, we have the digital capabilities as well improving uh, and the back office pieces that I mentioned earlier. Hopefully, Simon, that gives and you anything a more on the business travel? And sorry, on the business travel, um, our expectation is uh, when we look at uh, the mix of it, uh, generally, uh, for us, it ends up being about 50-50. Um, depending on the quarter, you may see spikes going to two-thirds, one-third, either way. Um, so it really is going to depend on when things open up. If we think about them in the back half of the year, um, you know, towards the summer months, it would obviously be indexed towards consumer. And as we head back into the fall, the ratio or index uh, heads back to business. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Simon. Uh, next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Drew McReynolds of RBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, good morning. Um, Joe, just to uh, add to Jeff's comment or question on 5G and your comments, um, just uh, update us in terms of your subscribers that are currently uh, you know, using your 5G network. Are there any kind of data points you can update? us on uh, specifically on that um, and then secondly on the capex um, you know appreciate you, you don't want to quantify anything at this point are you able to um, bigger picture have you done in the past just comment on uh, how you think ci generally trends both in in cable and wireless um, you know are we still tracking to to what has generally been kind of guided to over the last two or three quarters uh, and then lastly, uh, for you, Tony, you know, you've talked about uh, uh, looking at ways to get better recognition of the public markets of some of those non-telecom assets. Uh, just wondering whether initiatives are continuing to kind of move forward uh, on that file. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Um, on the 5G uh, subscriber side, um, we have not disclosed any specifics, but what I would tell you just through, you know, sort of um, maybe more self-evident is that the 5G subscriber base uh, is indexed towards the iPhone, and we have the largest iPhone base. Uh, the 5G subscriber base is um, tied to uh, unlimited and therefore they are by definition our highest value, most data consumptive uh, customers. So this really is about the very top decile of the market. And uh, part of our energy around getting out there quickly is, you know, inside the, if you were to do a segment analysis of our base, um, uh, we, we've got a very strong um, uh, top end of the market base that we've had historically because of you know, structural advantage around the iPhone and um, uh, going back even to when the BlackBerry was a thing. Um, I know it sounds ancient at this point in time, but but like so that base has a need for certain capabilities and you know, unlimited is there. The unlim the sharing nature of unlimited has played well with that base, and they were the first to sign up for a 5G phone. So so you know, very important to the retention lifetime value of our most valuable customers. Um, on the CapEx front, um, the, the, the core of our CapEx is going to be spent on a handful of things. One is continue on the 5G front. Um, our view is um, we're, uh, we've got good momentum in terms of our capability. The team has done a great job and well-tuned in terms of the multi-year roadmap around it. We've done a good job of negotiating great agreements with our vendors both the vendors of technology and the vendors of the civil engineering efforts around that. And therefore, we are on a roll. And the best thing you can do when it comes to network build is keep it going and have contiguity and not have start-stop. Start-stop is the, is the death of network build efficiency. So we're going to keep rolling on that front. Uh, and when it comes to the cable business, um, we're going to keep rolling on that front, both with brownfield and greenfield uh, node segmentation. We've been doing node uplifts across our cable business. We're roughly about half of the way through that. Uh, you see the homes pass per node has gone uh, down dramatically over the last few years as a whole. And um, we've got you know, 
uh, some GPON activities and efforts underway in Atlantic Canada, and where there's aerial opportunity to do so on a more, on a more attractive basis. So we're going to keep pushing on that front for the same reasons I just described. And third is, is um, we've seen tremendous benefit from the, our digital efforts, and we've got an even bigger appetite for some things down the road on digital. And it's not just digital in terms of service or in terms of sales, as we've described today, but a whole bunch of digital opportunities in terms of better managing network capability and reliability. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, we've got some AI tools that every day look through the network, and because of the new Ignite gateway and capability, we have an opportunity to understand you know, what is the performance like inside the McReynolds house, uh, and are there issues with either Wi-Fi or devices, et cetera, uh, that are causing havoc or stress to you and your family, Drew. And then we have the ability to proactively either heal those without even you knowing about it, or we will just proactively send someone to um, do some maintenance or support you or swap out a particular box or device proactively. So we've built these tools that are a combination of analytical tools, you know, supplemented by machine learning uh, engine that gives us an even better ability to understand, you know, what's about to go uh, into an unacceptable state for a customer and what can we do proactively. So those three things, it's foot on the gas and let's, you know, to the extent that, that we can, let's go. The, the biggest question mark is with COVID, you know, it's building permits and city planning departments and all the things that got in our way last year. Um, so far, so good, but you, you know, those are the kind of the question marks. Our, our goal, our view is the CapEx intensity that We've articulated, articulated still intact. You know, think about 22% or so for cable, and think about you know 12 to 15% for wireless. So nothing's changed in terms of those zones of CI. Um, uh, just really focused on the areas that matter most, as you would expect us to be. And our ability to get more done for the same dollar has gone up tremendously uh, as we've strengthened the capability of our network organization. They've done a incredible job actually of negotiating new contracts and getting better unit costs so we can get a lot more done at the same CI uh, than we could even a few years ago. So that's sort of the, the CI picture and I'll pass it to Tony on the third question. Uh, on the last part of your question Drew in terms of I think what you're getting at is um, we had stated in the past looking at surfacing value from some of our significant assets uh, that sit on our balance sheet today. We haven't lost sight of that uh, we continue to look at alternatives and want to be uh, careful and very opportunistic about it. Uh, and during this COVID environment, it doesn't lend itself uh, as an optimal time, particularly as we switch our execution um, focus uh, on operating uh, new operating uh, methods and processes uh, during COVID. And so that's where the focus has been. Uh, nothing to report uh, new on that on the uh, other assets front. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Drew. Uh, next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Tim Casey of BMO Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Two for me. Just one a clarification. Tony, could you just revisit uh, an earlier question about the, the $30 million one time? Uh, you, you alluded to gift cards and, and things like that. Could you just walk us through what's happening, happening practically uh, on that? related to, you know, lost activations and things like that. And second, just on, um, you know, your iPhone leadership, uh, just wondering if you have enough um, uh, loading of 5G to offer any early insights and in what you're seeing on behavior. And if you think um, that one of the is, you know, the potential for uh, an iPhone loading or, or super cycle, it's often referred to, is that one of the, uh, things that is, um, you know, making it difficult for you to provide guidance this year? Is that too much of a, a an unknown factor? Just wondering how that is influencing your thinking. Thanks. Um, Tim, I'll start with the first one. Um, in terms of uh, the $30 million, you know, as I said, it really relates to the one-time fees that uh, typically in Q4 with a much higher volume, um, um, you know, dri drives a certain amount, and we just saw lower volume uh, this quarter. I talked about activation 
uh, implicit in there, I should have um, highlighted, it include HUPs as well. And so one of the things you do see are the activations, but you don't necessarily see are the hardware upgrades. And we had lower volume this quarter, much lower volume than we would have had uh, last year uh, in the fourth quarter. Um, a number of other uh, fees, uh, I talked about price plan changes, uh, and then upfront promotional fees. And often we pivot to those um, uh, rather than um, you know recurring uh, discounts. Uh, and so um, we've had some of those in the quarter. Some of the other fees, and we can provide you a uh, full list, but, you know, they would be late payment fees, uh, suspension and reconnection fees. Um, and there are a few others that fall into that category um, that are, uh, are down year on year. And so that really is the quantum of the, uh, of the $30 million. In some respects, the decline of some of those fees relate to our bad debt performance uh, just being better, um, better than we expected and somewhat better on a year on year. Uh, perspective as well. And then the second part of your question, Tim, uh, I'm not sure we got it, but um, maybe you could rephrase it uh, to help us uh, frame the response. I'm just wondering what your expectations are for iPhone loading, and if if that's a, a you know a swing factor in how you're thinking about guidance. I wouldn't put it in the category of material swing factor. Um, uh, we uh, we have a healthy mix, uh, as Joe referred. You know, certainly iPhone would be um, you know at the top of the list in terms of handsets for us and the makeup of our base. Um, but it isn't uh, a factor from a guidance perspective for us. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Tim. Next question, Ariel. Our next question comes from Aravinda Galapadige of Canaccord. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, two on cost reduction from me and a quick regulatory question. Uh, on the cost reduction front, um, you know, we saw 13% decline in wireless other OPEX uh, yet again, as we saw in Q3. Um, obviously, part of it relates to roaming. Um, but uh, I was curious to hear, uh, Tony, if you can talk a little bit about uh, what component of that can be ongoing as we kind of look at um, some of the progress that you made on the digital front. And secondly, um, I think, Joe, you know, you, uh, maybe perhaps a year ago, you kind of gave us some updates on uh, sort of the, you know, total wireless COA in particular, the PNL impact of the wireless subsidies being somewhere in the 900 million uh, neighborhood. Uh, and um, you know COA probably being four four fifty. I know that you can't disclose specific numbers, but directionally, how much progress has been made on that front, and maybe sort of uh, the outlook from there on. And lastly, um, you know, given some of the changes to ISEV leadership, is there any comment you want to make about sort of government relations uh, ahead of um, you know potential decision on the wholesale front? Thanks. Arvindo, I'll start with um, your question in terms of uh, some of the cost categories. Uh, I've touched on them earlier on the call. Uh, just to reiterate, I put them probably from the wireless side into three categories, um, and I wouldn't underestimate the impact uh, that installment plans and the related margin improvement has had. If you were to look at our um, 370 basis point uh, margin expansion in wireless, about a third of that comes from hardware margins. Uh, and so, you know, that shift have, has been uh, a good one for us and a good one for the industry um, in Canada. Uh, the second piece relates to channel mix, and uh, costs on channel mix uh, have just become much more efficient, especially as we move to uh, direct channels um, and digital channels. And that's coming through in, uh, as we said, our COA and our COR, and even as volumes improve, uh, it's a per unit cost that has actually uh, come down um, uh, quite substantially. Uh, and so that's been helpful. And then the third is, um, you know, what we lump together as back office costs, including our call centers. Uh, and so there are a number of factors in there, but if you took even just the call centers, with the migration of our base more and more to unlimited, we are seeing the reduction in call volumes, for example, that we had expected. Um, and so that continues to, uh, to drive it down. 
in terms of the sustainability, um, other than the first one, you know, channel mix and back office costs, uh, we continue to see opportunity and they are sustainable. Uh, and similarly on hardware margins, although those are more impacted by market conditions. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to follow sort of how that plays out in the market. Um, but we do believe um, um, it, it is an opportunity for continued improvements. And then on the cable side, uh, we're seeing much of the same uh, in terms of categories. I'd replace hardware margin with content costs, which in our cable business represents 50% of our cost structure. Uh, and what we've seen is um, with the Ignite platform, more of an ability to um, change the packaging and channel lineup um, so that we are dropping channels that cost us money but aren't of interest to customers. Uh, it sounds very basic, um, but the team's been uh, very particular in going through that and uh, reducing costs. Um, even in the event that it's a 1, 2, or 5% cost reduction uh, on an $800 million cost base, um, it ends up being a significant uh, savings. And then finally, um, self-install and reduction of service truck rolls. Some of that is capitalized. Um, uh, but some of it is OPEX. And so you're seeing that play out in both uh, our capital improvements as well as our OPEX. We continue to see opportunities to continue to improve that. Um, and so again, I would put those in the category of very much being sustainable. Arvinda, I, I hope that helps because, you know, just the Tony hit the punchline. The, the, the majority of those costs uh, changes are, are structural and sustainable, and that's where we focused our, our attention as opposed to more temporal uh, costs, um, and we're pleased with, um, you know, you heard the, the one-third of the 370 basis points in wireless is around is around um, equipment margins, so that goes to your second question, really, which is, you know, are we seeing that subsidy ameliorate? Are we seeing better COA? You couple that with some of the channel mix that we've seen, heavy reliance on digital and uh, express pickup. Uh, delivered to the home with pro and the go, et cetera. Every one of those is a um, far better COA than some other channels. So indexing there, and I think, you know, customers are really enjoying it. Our satisfaction scores are, are super high in each of those customer journeys. I think that they will persist far beyond COVID in terms of how we do business. So they're also structural in nature. In terms of I said, um, you know, one of the one of the um, opportunities uh, that COVID provided to us was, you know, the ability to create a far more productive collaborative relationship with government, um, you know, both at the ministerial level and the uh, departmental level. We've seen that cooperation all through the last you know year overall. Um, I, uh, I do think that will persist. I think you know the the common goal of how do we how do we help support the needs of rural Canadians? How do we drive forward together between industry and government to bridge the digital uh, divide for the 10 or 15 percent of Canadians that don't have access to uh, the best internet for really largely economic reasons? Uh, uh, and the the return on investment in those areas is very has been very challenging since the beginning of the telecommunications industry. So being on the same side of the table around the rural connectivity issues, I think will bode well in terms of the nature of the collaboration, the cooperation um, that's there. Um, I have um, you know I'm, I'm grateful to Minister Baines for the support that he provided while he was in office. Uh, we had nothing but but uh, great discussions about the future of the industry, and you know uh, I am uh, very pleased with the conversation I had with uh, Minister Champagne. Uh, I think he's got an incredible background uh, and understands the technology sector and understands the business environment. We've had some great discussions around just what's important uh, on a go forward basis, and I I think at the heart of all regulatory environments is strong collaboration between industry and government on what matters most to the future. Uh, and that's where it starts, and, and uh, those are all good things. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, Arvinda. Uh, Ariel, we have time for two more questions. Our next question comes from Jerome Dubul of Desjardins. Please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks for uh, for taking my question. Uh, trying to look uh, a bit ahead uh, to a potential uh, recovery. Um, first on cable, we've seen a nice improvement in uh, in ARPA. Uh, how would you segment the the impact from price increase versus maybe other factors like uh, customers moving up in terms of uh, of download speeds? And then in media, last year you um, you said that uh, it could be difficult to achieve positive EBITDA uh, without game day revenue. Uh, now that's been better than than expected, but um, if if ever the Blue Jays can't go back uh, to playing uh, in Rogers Center, um, do you also expect um, a challenge uh, in terms of generating positive uh, EBITDA? Thanks. Thanks for the question, Jerome. Um, on the first one, um, very specific to cable and uh, the sustainability of ARPA increases. I think a couple of things. The price increase um, had, um, uh, I would say, about a one-third impact of the ARPA, uh, contributed a one-third to the ARPA increase that you saw. Uh, the other two factors um, that we saw uh, play out nicely uh, in not only this quarter but in prior quarters uh, was a reduction in promotional activity, uh, something we've talked about in terms of trying to bring discipline to uh, end of uh, promotion periods and do a better job of getting customers uh, onto uh, a new rate plan uh, that is sustainable rather than uh, just renewing uh, promotions again. And so we've been focused on when we look at uh, total promotions as a percentage of revenue in bringing that down. Um, and we're starting to see uh, good success in the marketplace on that. Uh, the second piece of it relates to uh, upgrades not only in migrating to our Ignite TV, but also to uh, higher um, uh, speed tiers, uh, as you would expect. And so you know, both of those are contributing nicely to the, the growth in uh, ARPA. Uh, and so you know, it's the latter two that we're really focused on as being uh, very much sustainable and continuing to drive uh, ARPA growth for uh, throughout the year. Uh, your second question related to media. Uh, I'm not sure I got it, but let me uh, try to help uh, in terms of, um, you know, if the Jays, um, we, ideally we're looking at, and as I talked about before, um, you know, break-even type of scenario um, for our media business. Um, the Jays is really the big swing factor, um, and so if they play in Toronto, um, there are more advertising revenues, as you would expect, that we can garner from that. Um, and if there are audiences, then that's a huge um, uh, potential for additional revenues, even if it's a quarter or a third of uh, uh, ticket sales. Um, so to the extent that they end up playing um, not in Toronto uh, and back in Buffalo or somewhere else, then what we're going to see is... Um, a significant drag on our media business. I don't want to provide too much uh, direction in terms of what that could be, just given the unknown variables, um, but it's a very material swing either way um, and contributed part of the reason we held back on giving uh, guidance. Uh, you know, that was one of the big three or four items that is still just a big unknown. Great, thank you. Great. Thanks, Jerome, and uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, attending the call. If you have any questions, please uh, feel free to give us a shout. Uh, thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day.